Moving to a new town is a common setup in horror, and with good reason. Every community is different, and the feeling of being an outsider intruding on an established area is overwhelming. This is exactly what the shopping list is all about. The game begins with our protagonist saying that they'll miss their old town, but hoping that their new home will be just as good. We aren't sure exactly why they're leaving their life behind, but they seem to have a very good reason for doing so. Once they finally arrive, they realize they have to get some things in the shops before they close. Which brings us to the gameplay. By pressing tab, you can bring up your shopping list. Everything from milk and shampoo, to toys and fresh meat. You go from shop to shop collecting the different items, and talking to the strange people who inhabit the town. The further you get through your list, the darker it becomes outside, and the shopkeepers warn you about the dangers of wandering the streets at night. Of course, if this was just a game about shopping, I wouldn't be talking about it. As you wander the streets, you might find something that triggers a memory, or start seeing people at the corner of your eye. Missing posters are everywhere, and the local police force, while seeming completely incompetent, are patrolling the area on foot looking for any dodgy characters. I won't spoil anything, but about halfway through this hour-long experience, the game changes and becomes something completely different. The writing is great. I like how weird the villagers are and how they don't really give you much useful information. It reminds me a little bit of Paratopic, especially with how creepy some of their faces are. While I think the dialogue and story is very entertaining, I do think the game could do with a spell check. Sometimes it's very clearly intentional, like the body shop lady who speaks almost entirely in valley girl text speak, but other times subtitles are just missing letters and punctuation. It's not illegible by any means, but it's annoying when it happens frequently. Frequently. Another thing that bothered me, and this is less of a criticism and more of an interesting question, I can't tell if the game is meant to be set in England, America, or somewhere else. A lot of the dialogue and logos in the game feel British, like the body shop, the police officer and his accent, but then there are other things like using the word mom, gas station, and some other accents. It's just a bit all over the place. Ultimately, this doesn't matter. I'm not sure where the developer is from, and really it's just something I noticed. Back to the game though, the second half really ramps up the horror. I would recommend playing the game with headphones on, because the music and sound effects are very effective, especially when things get darker. While the story starts off very ambiguous, if I had to criticize the game for anything, it would be that it kind of over explains itself. The more you learn about the protagonist, the clearer it becomes that something seriously wrong is happening, and when the NPC start noticing things too, the fear only increases. I say this a lot with indie horror games, but once you end the game with pure exposition explaining exactly what happened, it kind of kills it. I still think it's a fantastic game, and definitely worth your time. It manages to pull off some impressive scares, and the atmosphere is incredible. Also, any game that features a Minmo reference is absolutely perfect in my book. Do you ever wonder why Mario 64 of all games always seems to attract horror? Whether it's creepypasta or the whole every copy of Mario 64 is personalized trend from a while back, there's something about the game that makes it prime for spooks. Another Princess is in Our Castle isn't the type of game I usually cover, but I think it's definitely worth talking about. The demo has a very simple premise. What if you combined the castle from Mario 64 with the gameplay of a first-person amnesia-style horror game? The result is surprising surprisingly effective. You play as Mario, but instead of triple jumping and yahooing your way through the halls of Peach's castle, you slowly creep your way towards doors lantern in hand. Once you find your first collectible, a statuette of the princess herself, a pale figure of Peach appears and starts wandering the halls. Your job is to explore as many rooms as possible and find all eight statues, so that you can open the door upstairs and hopefully escape. If you remove the Mario skin for a moment, the game is a very basic run and hide horror game. If uninterrupted, the ghost runs on a loop, moving from room to room looking for the player. If you run or make too much noise, it'll head in that direction. This isn't to say that it's completely uninteresting though. While this genre is well trodden, I do think this game does some interesting things with it. For example, your hiding spots are these chests, and while they do a very good job of shielding you from the enemy, they also have a massive blind spot right in the middle. Oftentimes the ghost will walk by and go completely out of sight, leaving you with a few seconds where you're not sure if she's stopped or if she'll appear on the other 
other side again. I'm not sure if this idea will be in the final game, but I love the thought of Peach sometimes actually teleporting away when she goes into that blind spot, leaving you with no idea of her location. Anyways, while at first this may seem like a gimmick game that relies on your nostalgia for Mario 64, I think it's important to give it more credit than that. The stamina meter being based on 64's UI, the little... Peach uses when she's done searching an area, even the text on the game over screen feels very accurate. Beyond all that though, the reason it's such a good idea is because Mario 64 is actually a pretty creepy game. Think about the different locations that the castle has. The basement alone is already a horror game waiting to happen, never mind the literal haunted mansion. It's all there. While it may be a DMCA in waiting, I really hope this game is fully fleshed out and released, because I think there's a lot of potential here. So. Why not give it a try? See the Mushroom Kingdom from an entirely new perspective. What happens when someone spends their life trapped in a place with no windows or doors, told that the outside world is dangerous, but one day catches a glimpse of green grass and blue skies? They try to escape. The Other Side is a short escape room puzzle game where you play out this exact scenario. After a couple of people witness the outside world, every single one of them is silenced except you. Months later, after gathering enough materials, calling in favours and close calls, you finally have the means to escape. Now, you just need to make sure everything goes as planned. The gameplay is simple. There's an automatic drill connected to a computer in the middle of the room. Each piece of the drill, from the battery and oil to the drill bit itself, is interactable. Once you run the computer, it begins drilling the outer layer, but every so often, something will break. The computer tells you exactly what's failing. You remove the drill, set it back in the vise, and make any repairs necessary before placing it back where it belongs. The puzzles aren't particularly hard. Once you find where the tools are and how to remove each part, it becomes fairly easy. It's almost therapeutic with how you have to take each section step by step, disassembling and reassembling the same few parts. Eventually, your drill breaks through the outer layer, and you receive a warning. Drilling through the final layer will set off the security system, and you'll only have five minutes before the guards find you. What started as therapeutic has now become a tense rush. Now when the drill fails, there are three or four things wrong at once, forcing you to think about how you'll sequence your repairs in the correct order so you don't waste any time. The way the game introduces you to the mechanics in a controlled environment, and then slaps a timer on it in the second half, is a genius way of building tension. It's a very simple premise for a very simple game, and it's only about 15 minutes long, but it's one of the most effective uses of a timer I've ever seen. You spend so much time worrying about the escape that you forget to really think about what's truly going on here. Why are you trapped? Why are they so desperate to keep people locked in here? What is actually on the other side? All of these questions are answered, and while I would love to see a longer version of this game, the ending is still good. I'm a huge fan of minimalist games. I like seeing how much a developer can scare you with as little as possible. The entire game takes place in one room, and there's no enemies besides the threat of being caught. It actually reminds me a lot of another indie horror itch game that I've somehow not talked about up until this point. What is there to say about Iron Lung that hasn't already been said? Created by the wonderful developer of Dusk, Iron Lung is an incredibly simple game. In this world, every known star and habitable planet has disappeared, with only a few space stations left housing the surviving humans. While searching for organic life, or an explanation for the so-called quiet rapture, humanity discovered something peculiar, a moon with an ocean of blood. You play as a convict, tasked with going deep into the blood ocean in a submarine named the Iron Lung in order to investigate and take photographs of whatever may be down there. The gameplay is very simple. You have a map with important locations on it, and you navigate your submarine to these coordinates. You can turn the ship, go forwards and backwards, and take photos from the front. Besides taking photographs, there's no way to see what's happening outside the ship. As you explore, the oxygen in your submarine dwindles slowly, and other issues arise that need solving. The problem with talking about Iron Lung is that the footage really doesn't do the game justice. It's about an hour long, and almost all of that time is spent pressing the same four buttons and listening for the warning sounds that tell you how close you are to crashing into a wall. The game relies on you getting into a sort of zen, checking your map, 
moving your ship slightly to the left or right, slowly making your way through the void before it snaps you back into reality with a quick scare. A lot of my favorite moments are when things just feel off. Like when you know there's no wall in your way, yet the sensor tells you that something is definitely in front of you. Of course, the big moments come from taking photographs, when you suddenly catch a glimpse of whatever is so important that you've been welded into this death trap to find. Much like the other side, the game takes place entirely in one small room, and focuses on you doing repetitive tasks, and they also both rely on an ambiguous world that is clearly hiding more than it lets on. Since I first played the game, it received an update which added a lot of lore and supplementary info that helps expand the world. And while it is very interesting, I think the best part about Iron Lung is just how much it can accomplish with such simple gameplay. If you've somehow not seen Iron Lung by now, I highly recommend giving it a go. It absolutely deserves it. I always like to throw in some abstract games into these lists, but even with all the weird worlds I've talked about, I don't think any of them are as vague as somewhat's please. The game begins in a room with a bed and a table. You walk to the door of the room and find a picture on the floor with a single word on it. Please. There is no dialogue in the game, not in the traditional sense. Our only hints as to the world outside the building are told through fragments of headlines in newspapers, and the text on the photographs never change. You step out into the hallway and find an empty apartment building, the walls shifting and moving unnaturally as you make your way down it. Each door is closed, but murmuring, fighting, even crying can be heard if you put your ear up to them. Eventually, you'll find your way down the stairs and are greeted with a giant machine in the middle of the room, industrial home filling your headphones. The game never tells you what to do. It doesn't really tell you anything at all. You decide that your task is to find the locations on the photographs. The only semblance of a story or direction you receive as a player is from the store page, which simply says, in an alternate timeline where we won the war, you are the repair person. You fix things. You keep things running. You do what you're told. We asked you so nicely. This description tells us a little about the world of Please, while simultaneously telling us absolutely nothing at all. Who is we? What war? What exactly is the machine that our character is repairing? Arguably, this description tells us less than the in-game newspapers, which at least tell us that the machine is linked to a new energy source. The more you explore, the more apparent it becomes that you may be repairing a source of great cruelty. While we never quite learn exactly what the machine does, all of the hints point towards something horrifying. The game completely relies on your brain filling in the blanks, and none of them are going to be filled in with anything nice. In 10 minutes with zero dialogue, Please manages to fill its world with a sense of dread. By the end, you'll feel like you've learned some terrible secret, when really, you were just following your instincts, going from photograph to photograph, fixing a machine whose purpose is completely unknown to you. But hey, you do what you're told. They asked you so nicely. Thanks for watching! As always, all of the games mentioned in this video can be found in the description, and I highly recommend checking them out for yourself. If you want to follow me on my socials, they're all in the description too, including my tip jar if you're feeling generous. You can also subscribe if you want to support me and leave a comment. It really helps me out. My next video is going to be a massive one. I've already started editing it, so it should be out soon enough. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you real soon.